What's up, punks? Today is Sunday, October 13th, and we are bringing you a Block Digest special edition uh, with Jeff Vandrew. Um, actually, he's been a previous guest before for uh, his project. I'm kind of trying to do a Bitcoin-based Patreon, but this time we're going to be asking him for his expertise in uh, his profession as a tax attorney. So uh, how are you doing today, Jeff? Not bad at all. Thanks for having me. And no par Janine, how about you guys today? Uh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah, so I'm still in Transylvania. It's 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 a really good conference. Uh, I'm enjoying it, but I'm really tired too. <laughs> Alrighty then. Uh, well, keep I've... yourself safe from vampires. I believe someone has to do the obligatory disclaimer that this is not tax advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess we, we should get that uh, out of the way. Do you want to <laughs> kick that off, Jeff? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'll just give my very, very brief background for those that might not have heard me on the last episode I was on, and then I'll, I can run into that uh, disclaimer, too, since they're sort of interrelated. So, uh, my name's Jeff Vandrew. I'm, an I'm licensed as an attorney and a CPA. Um, I've also, uh, as was said during the intro, made some open source software contributions so, uh, that are Bitcoin related. So, I kind of you know, hit both ends of today's discussion topic. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind, though, is despite being both an attorney and a CPA, I'm not your attorney and I'm not your CPA if you're listening to this. So you need to consult your own tax advisor. Everything that we're talking today is purely educational. All right. <clears throat> I guess uh, legal ass covering out of the way. I guess you want to just kind of take us through, I guess, the, the guidance released by the IRS and kind of some of the the reasons behind it, you know, uh, you kind of pointed out before we started recording, uh, people don't realize that the IRS can't make new laws. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's a really good, there's two things that I want to start out with that being one of them before we even dive in here. The first thing is just for the sort of purposes of our discussion today. And I think all our hosts realize this is more for the listeners. Um, everything I'm saying, I'm not coming at it from the angle that this is the way I think things should be. You know, I'm making purely descriptive statements here, not normative statements. People tend to get very emotional, particularly on Twitter, unfortunately, about their taxes. Um, and they kind of just throw things out that, you know, certain things might make them upset or seem unfair. And while I'm certainly sympathetic to that, you know, uh, at least for the beginning part of this discussion, I'm, again, just making descriptive statements as to how the law stands as of today. And frankly, you know, I, I don't have... Uh, a particular bias or horse in this race in terms of me making any money off the tax laws being complicated because despite being an attorney and a CPA, uh, it's only a tiny part of my practice is actually filing, you know, individual taxes. Most of what I do for a living is legal structures for IRAs that allow people to hold Bitcoin in their IRA while holding their own private keys. So that out of the way, jumping into what the actual ruling did. So what was released by the IRS was actually two things. They released a revenue ruling and, uh, and an FAQ. And it's important to keep in mind that whenever the IRS releases any guidance like this, they can't make the laws. Uh, only Congress and the courts can make the laws. The IRS can issue interpretations on those laws, which, which essentially represent the IRS's position on the law. That doesn't mean that those positions can't be challenged. Uh, if a taxpayer out there wants to file a tax return that is uh, not following a particular revenue ruling or something in an FAQ, they can certainly do that. The IRS, you'll definitely lose on audit with the IRS, and then you have the ability to take the IRS to tax court um, or actually to circuit court as well. There's a variety of different avenues, but we'll just say to court in order to challenge that interpretation um, as not being reasonable. And the, without getting too far into the weeds, the, the level of deference that an IRS interpretation is granted depends on the type of guidance issued. For instance, the FAQ would, be a, would have very, very little deference in court. 
the revenue ruling would have more deference than the FAQ, but not as much as a treasury regulation, which is sort of the highest level of deference other than obviously a statute or court ruling. A treasury regulation has a much longer process to be issued. There has to be a comment period and a whole thing. So again, what was issued here was a revenue ruling and an FAQ. The, mo the, the part of this that has gotten the most publicity um, has to do with forks. And that's really was addressed in both the revenue ruling and the FAQ. And what the IRS really did here, for better or worse, is they followed the law essentially as it's as it has stood this entire time. Uh, most people that have been practicing in this area have been handling forks this way all the the whole time from the very beginning. And essentially, what it said was, if there is a fork, so we'll use the Bitcoin Bcash fork as an example. When there's a fork. On the date that you receive dominion and control over the coin, the new coin that you receive in the fork, you have taxable income in the amount of fair market value on the date that you receive that dominion and control. So if you're someone that owns their own private keys, you had dominion and control on the date that the ledger was established because you then you were basically vested title in those Bcash coins on the date the ledger was established. You had the ability to move, sell, do whatever you wanted with your coins at that point. So you had taxable income as to the, uh, as to the value of the Bcash you received on that date. The situation would be different, for example, for someone who had their coins on Coinbase, because if you had your coins on Coinbase, you don't have your keys. So you did not have dominion and control over your Bcash on the fork date. You didn't have dominion and control until the date that Coinbase actually credited your account, which actually has really screwed people that had their coins on Coinbase because Coinbase credited the account on the date that uh, Bcash was on the all-time high. So in a nutshell, and I'll, I'll take a breath here and allow any questions before I go into the bad parts about the ruling, what it didn't do well, but that's what the, the ruling and the part of the FAQ that addressed works themselves was trying to get across. Okay, so there, there's really a couple things I kind of want to break down in here. Um, <clears throat> one, um, chiefly, obviously, the what constitutes fair market value, because I think that is a, a big opportunity for shenanigans. And then also, um, a lot of edge cases um, for that. So, like, to, re to get an edge case out there uh, real quick, like, for example, um, Jeff Garzik forked um, United Bitcoin. But the way that this fork happened was an incredibly shady um, fork that was not announced um, ahead of time and pretty much confiscated um, all non-claimed coins after a certain time period. And so like the, the, the way I'm interpreting all of this, like I, for that time period, had control and dominion over these coins. But it was taken away from me because I was not informed and had the ability to act um, in a timely manner because not being informed. So, like, how does a situation like that work out? Like, I had the dominion, theoretically, but then it was taken away. So, am I now liable for that income despite the fact that I don't have control over that money anymore? So, yeah, that that's a really cool uh, edge case to sort of talk about. Um, so... I'll address the fair market value first before we get into that edge case because that's sort of, that's a little bit clearer. Um, and mm -hmm. then I'll use your you know your edge case as a really specific example. So for fair market value, want and it's good that you brought that up because one of the memes that's floating around Twitter is oh I'm just going to create a fork coin and uh, I'll do one trade for one coin at a thousand dollars and give everybody a billion coins and then everybody's going to have all this income. Well. That's not how fair market value works. Fair market value is determined uh, by what a willing buyer would pay a willing seller for those coins in an arm's length transaction. So that's inherently subjective, but and it, uh, it definitely has some edge cases, but in a lot of cases, it's pretty clear. For example, if it's a coin that is trading with any real liquidity, like Bcash was, um, you know, at the time of the fork, you know. Uh, there are, are plenty of reasonable methods to determine fair market value, which will generally all be accepted by the IRS as long as they're consistent. 
what most people did in that scenario is they just used uh, a daily average on the fork date uh, for the, you know, from different exchanges, or you could even use probably, uh, it would be fair to use an average from a couple days around the fork date um, okay, on, on various different exchanges. Real quick here, I'm going to yeah. get through this part. I kind of want to like stay here for a minute before we go to the United Bitcoin Edge case. Yeah, sure. Um, so like part, part of the, the issue with like I see because like, um, you know, you have this requirement for like an actual substantial amount of liquidity and the ability to sell it. But, you know, one thing I think that isn't really being considered here is um, what prevents me from faking that with my own Bitcoin trading this against Bitcoin OTC? Like, how can you tell whether there's actually like legitimate millions of dollars of value or if I'm just shuffling my own Bitcoin back and forth? So I like I, I could practically create the illusion of a fair market value of a fork that is literally just me shuffling funny money between myself. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, you know, the issue is basically this. Exchange volume is really only indicative of fair market value if there's a if it can be reasonably be believed to be real so is it possible that someone could engage in an elaborate enough scheme to create enough liquidity to make something look real that it would fool the majority of people yeah i mean i suppose that that is theoretically possible i think it would be very difficult um if a coin you know the, the position that i would take for my clients frankly is that if a coin is not trading on any open exchanges and it's only trading OTC or it's only trading in, if you want to call something a dark pool or something like that, um, I don't think that that volume is indicative of fair market value at all, frankly, because we don't have any sort of indication whatsoever that we could reasonably rely on those being arm's length transactions. So I don't think that that sort of thing is indicative. And in fact, if that's the only volume um, that we're aware of at the time, I think there's a pretty good argument that the fair market value is zero. Um, and that's just another point, a related point that I wanted to make to a lot of people that are worried about just these constant forks. While there are constant forks of Bitcoin, they're all worth zero for the most part um, or near zero. So despite the fact that you may have a realization, well, you met, uh, there's two points to that. One, even if you do have a realization event on that fork date, um, the realization event would be at zero, right? Where it would be at near zero. So it really wouldn't be anything particularly to worry about. Just for my own personal opinion on this is that if you've been holding Bitcoin this whole time, the only forks where you had any realizable actual value were Bcash and Bitcoin Gold. Or if you didn't sell your Bcash and you ended up with BSV, then also BSV, but that's probably it. And the second point that's you know important to make uh, that's related is the revenue ruling focuses on dominion and control, but the actual case law says that in addition to dominion and control, you need something called an accession to wealth. Um, so that also kind of is interrelated with the fair market value issue where if something is trading so thinly or not on any sort of, uh, you know, uh, open or uh, I don't know the right term to use here. If something's only trading in, these sort of you know shady OTC dark pools with you know questionable volume. Not only is the fair market value itself a question, but you also have the question as whether you, as to whether or not you've had any accession to wealth at all whatsoever. So for both of those reasons, in the scenario you sort of give, I think it would be in the scenario you give. I do not think you would have any income to claim. I guess that's the the too long didn't read there. Okay, so you just, you just let let me drop drop here something. In, in the moment of fork, it's not even clear if it's a fork or it's going to be reorged. Now, in the moment of the fork, there is no trading activity, so the fair market value is exactly zero. Now, in the one day, maybe there will be some trading activity, but that price is going to be completely different than what it will be months later when it i wouldn't say stabilized but it becomes something more realistic yeah. usually everything starts out either with 
very small or on the in the sky uh, there is no such a thing as oh it just starts out with the perfect price no the market needs time to actually figure out what the price is going to be uh, so it is impossible to figure out what price how much taxes you should pay in this context but <laughs> oh, okay uh, uh, only this one I will I will drop in the other argument of mine later so what, what do you say that it is impossible to to actually assess any forks real value in the day in the week of the fork well, unfortunately, that's a downside of a volatile asset. Um, and this is not really all that unique to cryptocurrency. I mean, there's historically, there have been all kinds of volatile assets where valuation has been an issue. Um, I'd say, I mean, to your point, I'm not saying it's the most just or fair thing in the world, but it, I mean, the value of the income that you receive I'll give you an example. Like, let's say in the there's a fork, and well, let me even just use you know Bcash as an example, right? Um, there's a fork, and shortly after the fork, you know, you determined the the value of your Bcash to be three hundred dollars a coin, right? It, it, you know, somewhere around that thing because you looked at the trading prices, you know, either over the day of the fork or you looked at the few days around the fork or however you did it, any reasonable method like that would frankly be fine and that's what you did. But then you held on to your Bcash and you didn't sell it until months and months later and you sold it, you sold it for a hundred dollars a coin, right? So the way the tax lot deals with that is you had uh, $300 of income on the fork date and you had a $200 capital loss on the date that you sold it because that amount of income that you recognize on the date of the fork, that becomes your cost basis in the coin and then you have a gain or a loss on that coin when you sell it in the future. Um, people don't like that and I understand why because you know a capital loss income can generally only be used against capital gains. It can't be used against your ordinary income that you had to claim on the fork date but this generally has been the existing law around what's called treasure trove in the United States. And that's sort of what I wanted to get across here. I mean, the existing case law uh, on treasure trove has basically corresponded exactly to um, what the revenue ruling put out. And that's essentially, you know, treasure trove, a good example of that would be if I find uh, an antique in my backyard and it's worth, X dollars, that's the amount of income that I have to claim. If I sell it, if I choose not to hold on to it and I choose to wait it out and sell it later, then I have a capital loss. I mean, that's just, unfortunately, that's the nature of the tax code on the laws. It stands for uh, a very, very long time. Thank you for the answer. My second point is that I'm a Bitcoin software, Bitcoin wallet developer, and it took me days to figure out how the heck should I take my Bcash, my Bitcoin cash from, separate my Bitcoin cash from my Bitcoin. And it took me like half a day to finally give up trying to sell my Bitcoin gold because it was just such a convert if your wallet doesn't support you doesn't give you an easy way to take it off then it's hard to figure out and people have multiple wallets now if i wasn't able to figure it out within a reasonable time frame it cannot be expected from americans to be able to figure it out yeah, I mean, I agree that it, that is, uh, you know, uh, a hole here um, that sort of that is new to crypto of concepts that were applied in this revenue ruling. These are very old concepts that go back, you know, probably about 100 years. I mean, there's treasure trove cases going back 100 years um, and they were just sort of existing, applying existing treasure trove law to something that is very new. And you highlighted one of the, you know, very serious problems with trying to apply law that was designed in a different era to the modern world. And I think that was even 
highlighted further by the fact you know uh, that in the revenue ruling itself, the IRS used the word airdrop in a way that you know we would never even use it um, as people that you know know anything about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency at all. Um, so to answer your question, could they have provided a better you know definition of dominion and control? Probably they could have done it. They could have tried to come up with some sort of an interpretation of dominion and control that took those factors into account, but it would have been very difficult. It would have been very difficult. Um, so I think that what they were doing there is trying to just take the easiest method possible, not necessarily the fairest. And I guess let me give a better example. The IRS has no way of determining when you claim the amount of income, the amount of technical know-how that you have to be able to claim your coins, right? So whether it would take you a day or a week or a month, or you'd have to hire an expert to do it, um, that's very subjective. So I think they kind of just went with uh, the most objective method that they could use for doing this while remaining in the existing law. Um, that said, I was going somewhere with this. Ah, I'll uh, I'll cut it there. I think I I think I made I think I made the point that I was trying to make. Even me as a professional on this stuff, sometimes I end up talking myself in circles. Yes, it was a very good explanation. Uh, one more thing I want to add, just just some interesting thing that uh, these forks usually don't pay that much attention to their forks because th these are scams uh, by design not all of them starts out like this but they don't pay attention so if you don't take out your money and you start transacting with your bitcoin then there are nodes who are just broadcasting the exact same transaction on the other fork too so you are losing access to to that money and yeah, it, it happened with probably with everyone, even with me. I shouldn't be able to take okay, no, out every no B cash of mine. Actually, I, there's one point I really want to make real quick on that. Um, and that I think is uh, that actually you brought you kind of jogged my memory there as to a, uh, a really good point. You can, and this exists in the existing case law, I, this is a really important point. When you end up with treasure trove, which is essentially what this is, you can, in fact, reject it. Um, and then you do not have a taxable event um, in that situation. But it has to be a timely rejection. So, for instance, uh, if you were to, uh, you know, dig up a gold bar in your backyard, you can't reject it by just throwing it in your, uh, you know, throwing it in your closet and waiting to see what happens with it. But you could call the police and have them take it away or throw it in the trash or something of that nature. And that would be a timely – I mean, I don't know why you would do that, but you could, and that would be a timely rejection. There's an old IRS general counsel memorandum that deals with this uh, in the context of free samples. Like if someone sends you a free sample of something and you just trash it uh, in a timely manner, you don't have income or you send it back to them. And the most famous recent example of this is in 1998 during uh, sort of – this won't make sense to non-U.S. listeners. But in the, in the late 90s, we had a situation in the U.S. where, unfortunately, because of performance-enhancing drugs, there were a series of home run records being shattered, right? And these home run balls that were going into the stands uh, – this is professional baseball uh, for those outside the U.S. – those were very valuable for the fan that caught them. There was a worry that if a fan caught a ball and he gave it back, if he, desert, if he decided not to keep it, he could end up owing all this tax despite the fact that, you know, if you caught Mark McGuire's home run ball, you, uh, you, ha you gave it back to him. You didn't really have any wealth there. And the IRS did clarify that if you catch a home run ball and you give it back right away, you don't have any tax in that situation. The reason this is a problem with cryptocurrency is how without i mean your right to those coins is published on this distributed ledger how do you reject it short of taking a lot of time and effort to access your coins just so that you can burn them right if you did that that would be a timely rejection but frankly that would be crazy right because i mean if you were going to spend all the time to extract your forked coin out you would just sell it or hopefully trade it for more bitcoin instead of uh instead of burning it 
So what I think, this is something I was going to talk about later, but you really sort of jog my memory as to it now. What I think the IRS should have done in this ruling that they would have been allowed to do without violating current law is allowed you to attach an election to your tax return every year that said, hey, I disclaim all the forks I received this year other than the ones that I specifically list here. Um, and that would have made things very clear that you were taking an affirmative action to reject those forks. And now by doing that, the IRS would have needed some sort of a hammer to come back at you later if you filed this election in, you know, this year to say you were disclaiming a fork and then five years down the line, yeah, you, know, you still had your keys, you grabbed your coins, and at that point, you know, you've sort of acted in a way that contradicts the election that you filed with the IRS. So my idea sort of there was that what the IRS should have done was allowed you to file that election, and since they're allowing you to file that election as a matter of administrative grace, as an easier way to reject your forks rather than having to go out of your way to burn them, in exchange, you would have had to have agreed to and extend the statute of limitations for audit for that year, but only with respect to the forks that you disclaimed. So that if 10 years down the line, you know, uh, you acted in a way that was not consistent with the fact that you disclaimed those, uh, well, those forked coins and you claimed them, and that ended up being reported on your return, the IRS could in fact go back and assess that 10 year old tax um, because you didn't stick to the fact that you know you disclaimed those coins. So that's what I think they should have done to handle the uh, you know the timely rejection issue. Okay, hold on. No para, like dude, pick a device and mute the other one because you are feedbacking into yourself every time you talk. Like I'm gonna like make a really loud noise so this is easy to find in that outlet. Okay, uh, go forward from there. Yeah, so I definitely am interested in like the different ways that you can, I don't know, show that you're rejecting coins because I'm, cause, and also I wonder how it applies because I know that it's more complicated when it's on an exchange versus when you're holding your own keys. But because like I've never held coins on any exchange. And so I was under the impression that as long as I didn't ever initialize the keys, to look at any of these four coins in any kind of software where I could even see it or spend it or not spend it or whatever, that that would be considered a rejection. And even if that wasn't considered a rejection, I could still go back, you know, years later and say, well, look, I've ignored these, all of these coins. You can see I've ignored them because none of them have moved since the fork and I don't have it initialized in any software, but it sounds like that's not enough of a thing to do. Right. The problem with that, and, and that's the argu that's a big Twitter argument, right? But the, there's sort of the more uh, 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 legalistic problem with that and a practical problem with that. So the, the legalistic problem with that is what that's akin to doing is you tripping over the gold bar in your backyard and just sort of leaving it there, right? You don't sell it. You don't do anything with it. You just kind of leave it there. And it's pretty... It's pretty clear under existing case law that that I mean that doesn't affect the fact that, that you had a taxable event there because you became aware that you had an accession to wealth and you had dominion and control over it. Um, so I, I think that that would be the the non cryptocurrency analog there. The other thing, from a practical perspective, why the IRS essentially can't uh, there's no, it can't really take that possession. Uh, position, excuse me, is that how would they possibly, it would create a situation where you're not treating similarly situated taxpayers in a similar way. Because if they adopted a rule that said, okay, until you make the first move, first of all, they can't police at all whether you download the software and view the amount of coins that you have, right? So that's there's no practical way to actually enforce the tax code that way. Could they say that you don't have the realizable event until you move the coins? I mean, in theory, I suppose they could. I actually, well, under existing law, I don't think that they could. But let's say just that they could, right? Um, that under existing law, they could. The practical aspect of that would be really bad 
because you'd have similarly situated taxpayers that all got their fork on the same date, all recognizing different amounts of info, uh, excuse me, different amounts of income based on the, how successful they were able to game the system by trying to pick the low value date to move their coins. So it's a little bit, it, 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 in addition to not being really possible under the law as it currently stands, it would also create a lot of practical issues. Um, one other point that I want to make, because there's just a ton of chatter on the sidebar about it, is like all this going offshore stuff for Americans. Um, none of that is a practical solution if you are a U.S. citizen and you're not going to renounce your citizenship. Uh, forming an offshore LLC that is controlled by you doesn't help you. An offshore trust doesn't help you. None of this helps you. Uh, and you're, you're definitely, definitely, definitely going to get in a ton of, uh, of trouble for doing that. Don't do that unless you're going to renounce your citizenship. Yeah, I mean, don't you still have to declare that under like foreign bank accounts and um, assets and things? Yes, exactly. There's not, all, not only by doing that are you not saving any taxes, your tax compliance costs, meaning the amount that, of time and money you're spending doing your tax filing every year, is going to stratospherically increase um, because of the amount of additional disclosures you're going to have to make. Uh, when you, I mean, U.S. citizens have additional disclosures they have to make when they have a controlling interest in an offshore entity. They have uh, additional disclosures to do it uh, to do when they own an offshore bank account. Um, there's additional disclosures when they own offshore non-bank account assets now. Um, so none of this stuff works um, it, unless you're frankly willing to give up your citizenship. Um, if you have massive, massive amounts of assets, there are certain ways that you can potentially sell those assets to offshore entities. They generally have to be they have to be offshore operating entities. However, they can't really just be purely investment entities. It is not practical. And yes, I am very familiar with Nomad Capitalist and all these things on the internet. Uh, it is definitely not a lack of familiarity for this stuff on my point. I'm giving all this as an aside, frankly, not because I think it's a good idea or I don't want you to save money. I just, I don't want to see anybody that's listening to this end up in jail or doing some bad stuff and getting themselves in trouble based out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. and, you know, re real quick, I, I kind of wanted to circle back a bit to the, like, um, you know, relinquishing control um, of something or kind of going like you, you don't want this like you would in a, a state inheritance, for example. Like another aspect of that that kind of really gives me trouble is let's say you do that and somebody else um, is able to steal your keys at some point. Like there's n absolutely no way to prove you are not the one who moved something. So as far as like relinquishing control, like I see zero options whatsoever except actually sending those assets to the control of either a government agency directly or somebody delegated by a government agency. Yeah, I think you're right about that. That's another, I mean, that's a really valid point about how hard it is to, you know, reject acceptance of this. And that's why... Honestly, I, I should have thought that they made this, that they, they really did have an opportunity here to come up with a clear way that you could disclaim or reject, whatever you want to call it in this scenario, um, control of those assets in a timely fashion. They should have even prescribed a, a time frame with which you had to do it. And that would have been well within the IRS's authority to do that. Um, unfortunately, they didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the most unfortunate thing about the fact that it took them until 2014 to issue any kind of real guidance, and then it took them until this year to update that, and it just seems everything is going very, very, very slowly. They're even breaking their own deadlines that they set for themselves, and like, um, so kind of a follow-up question about ways of rejecting. Is it possible, like, would would it be acceptable under you know, the the various, you know, they usually have like spaces for com extra comment or notes or anything when you're filing, it, would it be acceptable to them if you made a note about that in those areas of your tax filing, that you're rejecting these specific assets? 
Yeah, okay. Janine's question about uh, what would happen uh, if she made a note to her return that she's rejected the forks. The problem I, is that I don't think that's act, absent IRS guidance specifically like that I gave as a matter of administrative grace of them specifically allowing you to do that. I don't think a written disclaimer is sufficient because you still have, you know, the, those coins are still on the chain. You still have control over them. I still think that's akin to just telling your neighbor or I don't know. That's a stupid way to, for me to phrase it, but it's sort of akin to me just like writing down on a piece of paper. I don't want this gold bar in my backyard, then just sort of leaving it in my backyard, meaning I could still grab it at any time I wanted in the future. Um, so that's what I, I think the problem is there. I don't think that would be an effective way of disclaiming your coins. The only good news in all this, for practical purposes, the coins that you'd want to disclaim, at least to date, are ones that didn't have any value anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really think there should have been any value, any, any issue there. Um, the coins that, you know, had value... I mean, I, I can't, I mean, everybody's priorities are different. I traded all my Bcash and Bitcoin gold for more Bitcoin, right? right? Um, and I guess if you didn't want to do that, um, it's it's kind of a bummer for you getting phantom income. But I guess the only solace I can give is that most of these, you know, as I said, frankly, are not going to have any any, any claimable value on your tax return. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it sucks because uh, <laughs> Janine is one of those. Uh, uh, how how could I put this? Um, what one of those noble souls who who did not scam people by going, yes, give me more real Bitcoin, please. Yeah, and I'm I'm sympathetic to that. I I really am. Um, and it it, it unfortunately, there's just not the the uh, what I've said all along in these in this well all along it's been like a it's been like four days right but what i've said over the past four days publicly and on twitter and stuff like that is that the biggest everybody was everybody that was mad about this ruling was focusing on the wrong parts of it because they were focusing on like the way they things the thing basically things that the irs couldn't do under existing law the thing that really if you're going to be mad about something you should be mad about is that they didn't provide an easy way to reject the coins because that's something that the service could have done uh, and just didn't do. I think primarily because it just didn't have a good understanding of how forks work. And that was very clear in the fact that they used, they used this weird terminology where a fork, when, when a fork that results in a tradable coin afterwards, they called that a fork uh, followed by an airdrop, which is a very, very bizarre way to phrase that. It's not the way that we would talk about it on this show. Um, but I think it's just, you know, illustrative of the fact that they didn't really fully understand how these things work. And hopefully, like I said, hopefully due to the, the, uh, the level of outrage over this, they'll realize that they need to they need to provide, they don't even need to really rescind the old ruling. They just need to provide a way for you to make an election to disclaim these forks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I just briefly to explain why I didn't do it. For one, I had, yeah, like, I mean, one of the reasons, like Shinobi said, is that I didn't feel good about giving someone what I thought if I could even figure out which wallet to use and how to split it and do all of that, I didn't really, I wasn't interested in just dumping a shitcoin on someone if that was something that I could do. But I also didn't want to go through the process, first of all, of like figuring out which wallet was safe to use to put the keys in and then, fig, you know, managing all, like using wallets that I don't really trust and bringing keys out of what I consider to be a secure environment. And, you know, all of that. I didn't want to put my co the security of my actual coins that I care about at risk. So that was the primary reason I didn't do it. Um, but, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, you, you know, make another... I, the, your yeah. security point... Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut. I just want to say oh, real no, briefly, just, your security yeah. point's really good, too, because, um, you know, I took my time with with it to really try and... I, I didn't want to be the first guy to make an attempt at this. And in my case, that actually worked out, right? Because my Bcash increased in value uh, between the time period that it took me to sort of research that and, 
and, and then eventually uh, to extract it and then swap it for more Bitcoin. But that could have worked out the other way. Like even if someone like me that was willing to swap out their Bcash for more Bitcoin, if I had taken the time to really understand, and this kind of goes to some of the stuff Nopara talked about earlier, if I took the time to really, you know, understand the security risks, finally felt comfortable with it, it could have lost, it could have just as easily drastically declined in value over that time. And then, excuse me, I would have sort of been in an unfair tax situation where I had extra income and only a capital loss to offset it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's like... Uh... A really interesting argument against that I think but um way, way better than the, the point I was gonna uh, bring up um, so like the, the the issue I see if they actually do try to correct this at some point in the future and give a good way to like opt out of accepting this I mean like I said that necessitates like some place to actually deliver those assets out of your control and like there's two ways I could see doing that. Either just like send to a burn address, um, in which case you are pretty much attacking whatever coin um, you're doing that on because you're just bloating the UTXO set permanently in an unfixable way. Or like you're pretty much requiring the IRS or some delegate of them to actively like manage and condense those coins regularly to deal with that. And that's going to be like eating up traffic space on that network. Good. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, right. Well, I mean, what my proposal would be in that case would be by grace, the IRS could say, okay, we'll accept a written election where you promise you sign a written certification with your tax return that you won't touch these coins. The IRS could accept that as a valid uh, rejection of dominion and control. That's within their authority to do so. My only point is by doing that, they have to have some sort of a hammer if you were to later act in a way that was not consistent with that certification that you attached to your return. So certification, by the way, is a legal uh, a legal term of art. When you make a cert, when you certify to something, that means not only are you saying it's true, but you're specifically saying, "I understand that I'm subject to punishment uh, if I'm lying or if I, you know, you, you know, on this certification." So, the the easiest way I think to handle, you know, the hammer behind such a paper election, because as you mentioned, the problem. Is if you do if you do something that actually ceases your dominion and control in the context of cryptocurrency that creates all sorts of problems that the government doesn't want to get into. What I think they should do is just say, okay, in exchange for us allowing you to make this election and disclaim just in writing without having to take any physical act, burner address, you then agree on our part to an extension of the statute of limitations. So if we later see five years from now that you sold those coins, we can assess back tax from five years ago that would normally be outside, outside the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. And that's fair on both ends. You know what I'm saying? In other words, well, you know, you're getting something uh, in return for making that concession to the IRS. I, I don't, I don't think that's fair. I think that's, absolutely batshit insane because what that pretty much necessitates is every single american citizen completely doxing all of their coins to the irs and yeah no what i i i maybe i wasn't clear i'm not saying that you would need to provide your address um as part of that election what i'm saying is you're, you you'd say hey i'm disclaiming all these coins right and then, uh, you know, everything. And then later, if you went back and claimed it and sold it, when they would know because you'd be reporting a sale of XYZ coin on your Schedule D. That doesn't, that doesn't dox your address. I mean, you'd have, to, uh, you'd have to do that. You'd have to report that regardless of whether you made this fictional uh, election that I'm, you know, essentially have made up in my head and have no, uh, no, no knowledge at all that the IRS would go for this sort of a thing. It's just an idea that I came up with, but you're not actually, dis there's no reason you would actually have to disclose the addresses themselves any more than you'd have to disclose your addresses themselves right now. But if, if you don't disclose your addresses though, then they have 
zero ability to enforce or catch you in, in disposing of those after you you uh, claim that you're not receiving them. Well, they would, well, they would catch you with the amount. Right. Are they you would doing blockchain analysis to look into people at the IRS? Right. They would be using they would be using all the same tools they use now. So, in other words, in the year that you went back and claimed it and sold it, what you claimed it and sold it in some year, right? You know, let's say eventually you sold the coins. No, but coins. Let's, let's say I I don't claim it. Like I send them a letter saying that I'm not doing this, and then I move it and I sell it directly for Bitcoin, and I just don't tell them anything. Like they they have no way to find out that I did that and then enforce the agreement upon me. Right, but that's no different than that's no different than than their problem with cryptocurrency in general. So in other words, you could do that with your Bitcoin now, absent any fork, they're in that position now. So they just have to use all the same tools that they've been using all along. In other words, you're not disclo- you hold a bunch of Bitcoin. If you exchange it for something they have, I mean, they don't have your address. They have no way of knowing that other than their normal blockchain analysis or information they got from Coinbase or whatever the case might be. If you choose not to disclose that on your schedule D, so you either disclose that on your schedule D or you don't, that's nothing new with regards to forks. All I'm saying is if you do, if they do see that it's on your schedule D and then you had this election in place, they could go back and assess the additional tax uh, that you evaded by filing the paper election. Yeah, but you know, I mean, you know, not 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 to be kind of a dick, but you know, are, aren't you kind of making the the same logical mistake that was made in asking for this current clarification? You are thinking that they're going to respond reasonably instead of go, oh, well, here's a huge problem, and oh, if we clarify, we can shove this in and fix that problem. Yeah, I, I just don't whether or not the IRA whether or not there's a future regime that requires address disclosure, forks are not going to be the thing that pushes that over the edge and 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 creates that regime. That's going to happen or it's not going to happen and I just don't forks are way too small of an issue for for that to be the the thing that spurs it on. I mean, why? Why not? I mean, if if the, like this whole thing is is the IRS has the wiggle room to interpret existing law, but not actually create any. So why not try to push that interpretation as absolutely far in their favor as they can? Um, you know, barring legislators stepping in, because they don't need to. Like, they wouldn't need to use forks as like a cover to do that. I mean, for example, I mean, uh, yet on Friday. Separate from this guidance that initially came out, they released a draft form of Form 1040 that's going to have a checkbox on it. You don't have to disclose your addresses, but uh, your 1040 starting next year is going to have a checkbox on it that uh, you have to say, "Do I own or you know, do I own any cryptocurrency? Yes or no?" Um, and they didn't need forks as like uh, you know administrative cover to do that. They just did it. So my point is that if they're going to do that, they're just going to do it forks are going to have nothing to do with it one way or the other if that if they want to start requiring address disclosure they're just going to want they'll just start requiring address disclosure um i don't think they're going to do that because i don't know how useful it even is for them uh because uh uh, address disclosure would be a snapshot in time and you can always just mix your coins and then it becomes sort of not particularly relevant um at all going forward but i you know maybe i'm just being optimistic there and that's fine. But regardless of whether I'm being optimistic, they will, you know, they will um, require that in the future or not. I just, it's not going to have anything to do with this fork. They don't need the cover of an election for forks to require that. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good point. Janina, you wanted to ask something? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my main issue with this whole thing is that, um, because when these forks happen and then people sell their coins cause they don't want them, that's, you know, with this guidance, that's basically saying that you have two, you're basically forced into two taxable events. The first one is getting these four coins, which you didn't ask for. And 
we're basically like I made the analogy like you you made the analogy about finding a gold bar in your yard I made the analogy of someone shitting on my porch on one of the last um, Black Digest episodes because it's like someone came into or I mean it's not you know, blockchain is not really your property but it's, the analogy I made is like someone comes onto your property and shits on your porch and it's like yeah you technically this shit probably has some value to someone in a market or and you also have to pay someone to um to get rid of it but it just feels all i mean the irs is not uh, really an organization that respects volunteerism in any way but it just all feels very involuntary and like yeah it's just a i i think it's a really shitty situation yeah i mean it is um but like i said unfortunately it's just within i mean they're kind of bound by the laws that exist today and it always would have been some sort of a recognition event on the fork date because you acceded to wealth that had a assuming that it was a fork that actually had a real fair market value right we discussed how a lot of these forks uh in fact the overwhelming majority of them likely do not but using like bcash as an example uh yeah unfortunately under existing law you did accede to some level of wealth the problem the, the you know the bottom line problem is just that there's no easy way for you to reject this um, as you would with some other sort of tangible physical property or even intangible property that's existed up until now has generally been easier to reject than something like a uh, like a cryptocurrency fork. You know, well, I mean. Uh... Yeah, I know. At that when we started, we wanted to uh, get into some of the air quote positive side of this, and we're uh, <laughs> we just hit fifty three minutes on the clock. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, is there any more uh, plumbing into the the shitty side of things we want to do, or uh, want to move along into some of that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we pretty well covered it. Um, it just sort of you know, it, it is what it is. What it is. Um, I guess the only good part about it um, is that despite the fact that the, whole, that the the airdrop usage was completely confusing and for good reason, people didn't understand what that meant, but this is what we had all kind of been expecting, um, those of us that practice in the area, um, and this is what I, you know, from a personal level for my clients it's, and for my own return, it's the way I've been handling it all along, um, so if there's any minor positive, I mean, that's basically the only one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is really just like, you know, kind of a huge clusterfuck. And, you know, at least in my mind, I, I put out like a little solo video yesterday, kind of going over some of this, but th th this is kind of the, the last straw I think in my mind, as far as regulators trying to, I mean, not regulators, lobbyists trying to deal with federal regulators um, instead of dealing with the legislature, like whether that's at a state or, or a federal level. I mean, yeah. it's time to stop fucking around with people who don't have the power to change the rules. Right. That's actually, that's actually the, a really, really good point and uh, should really be the biggest takeaway is that we just need... We need an act of Congress here to deal specifically with uh, – I. it's funny. I, in this conversation, I've used the word cryptocurrency more times than I probably have in the past year. But I hate the word because usually I just say Bitcoin. But in this case, it really would be dealing with all cryptocurrency, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, we really do need an act of Congress to specifically deal with cryptocurrency um, in a more practical – not only how to deal with forks. And if it's an act of Congress, you don't even have to deal with the convoluted, um, you know, method that I gave of an election to disclaim. They could just specifically by statute state that, you know, forked coins, you don't recognize income on the date of the fork and you just have a zero basis in them. So you wouldn't have a taxable event until you sold them. And if you never sold them, you wouldn't have a taxable event. That would be a very easy pro taxpayer way to deal with this via an act of Congress, for instance, with the forks. There's a lot of other stuff they could do too. They could do a de minimis uh, exception for when you spend Bitcoin on things, similar to when you spend foreign currency on things, uh, you know, when you're on vacation, such that you don't have a gain or loss every time you make a lightning transaction to view uh, an article behind a paywall on the internet or something like that. 
So these are all things that could be dealt with, you know, in a comprehensive act of Congress. Unfortunately, most of these things are not things the IRS can just unilaterally do on its own. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it, it boggles my mind, like why so much of the time of, of groups like Coin Center has been spent dealing with like these bureaucrats. It's like we're dealing with something that that is just such a strange new thing that does not fit into old categories, especially legally. Like why the hell are you wasting your time with anybody except the people who can actually make new laws? Like it doesn't make sense. Yeah, for that, I mean, you know, the machinations of government and lobbying aren't uh, my forte. So unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that one. But I, as I said, I definitely agree that there really needs to be, well, either an act of Congress would be the best thing to clarify this whole thing. The other thing that could, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but that could eventually happen um, is if we got to the point where Bitcoin was being used in actual commercial transactions more frequently, um, a taxpayer who wanted to, to be a test case could take the position that it was currency and not property, um, which would be completely in contradiction of the 2014 guidance, but, uh, and could take that to tax court and potentially have that overturned. But in order to have a reasonable shot at that, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse because we'd have to be in a situation where, you know, it really was being used as currency in commercial transactions on a regular basis, which is not right now. Uh, frankly, so the the interpretation that it's property as of today is probably you know a very reasonable interpretation. And in order for it to be used more frequently as currency, it's like a circular problem, right? It would be good to have more regulatory guidance, which goes back to you know an act of Congress more so than uh, than these IRS interpretations. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my feeling because I'm just I'm completely dissuaded from from spending because of the fact that it creates all of these taxable events and obligations of what I have to file and everything. It just makes me not want to use it as a currency, even though I would normally use it if I didn't have all of these crazy, you know, requirements. Right. If you're American, it's a if you're American. I mean, if we're speaking purely on, uh, like, I guess, like non-ideological grounds, what would you would just do rationally um, just for bettering your own self? You're not thinking about others. You're not thinking about the future, right? It makes sense to use Bitcoin as a, a hedge, a store of value, a way to create wealth, essentially in the way that people have been using, you know, when I was young, people used gold. Um, but it really doesn't make any sense at all to use it as a transacting currency because you're creating a lot of additional work for yourself. Um, and I think that goes to exactly what I think you were trying to say, Janine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's, it's one of those like chicken or egg problems, you know what I mean? And it's, it's like, there, there really is like. The, the only way to, to deal with that is either get a law passed in Congress or just massive, massive amounts of people breaking the law <laughs> and, until you can go make the argument that the law is stupid. Look at all these people breaking it. Well, you wouldn't even have to have people breaking the law. Like the, They wouldn't be making the decision to break the law. They'd just be breaking the law without knowing it. Most of, like That's what probably is happening with a lot of people. They're, they're breaking... Because oh, I actually recently figured out um, there's a Twitter account called um, uh, One Felony a Day or something. And it's actually a lawyer who makes that account. And he's I think he's even going to write a book about it. And... You're, basically everyone is breaking some kind of law pretty much every day and they don't even know it because there are so many laws in the U.S. and not a single lawmaker um, alive has ever known all of the laws in the country. So Yeah, and I'm familiar, I forget the guy's name, but the book's actually been out for a while, um, the One Felony a Day book. It might even be like 10 years old. I, didn't, I actually didn't know he had a Twitter account. Um, but one of my friends is like a huge fan of the book. I haven't actually read it, but has said, has always mentions that he found it extremely enlightening and that essentially, like you said, the legal system's designed that we're all committing like multiple felonies per day. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, 
I, I get the general point you're trying to make, but I mean, it's if, if you're going to try and argue Bitcoin is a currency and not an asset, people have to use it like that. And I mean, the, I don't think there's any reasonable argument that you are unaware you're liable for capital gains when, whenever you discharge possession of Bitcoin, regardless of how you do that. And so it's like you, you either get a law passed or a shit ton of people need to break the law. What on that point, part of me wonders if so as much as ideologically and just, you know, the feeling in my gut was to sort of have an aversion to when Wall Street started in Bitcoin, it's just, yeah, I'm just sort of naturally an anti-banking person. Part of me has wondered if ultimately that's going to be what gets the laws around it changed, because now people that actually have a lot of you know, sort of cronyist influence will out of their own greed sort of have a motivation to try and, you know, not, not, not even suppress the value of Bitcoin, but even make it more clear in terms of how it's used, how it's taxed, et cetera. So part of me wonders if that's the only thing that ultimately will get us an act of Congress passed. I don't know the answer to that. I have no inside information it's just something that I've thought about a little bit recently. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that that's what it's going to take. I mean, it, it's really ultimately what the entire incentive structure counts on is all the people who get pulled into it acting in their own best interest. And I mean, the only way to take on the bigger entities is to wait till bigger entities get pulled into that. Right. And, you know, and, and even just individual congress people or whoever that own bitcoin that have a personal motivation to want to uh you know see this stuff changed mm -hmm. so real quick um maybe we're thinking of two different people but the the twitter account i was thinking of was crime a day um so at crime a day and then his real name he's a criminal defense attorney named mike chase and he recently published a book called how to become a federal criminal an illustrated handbook for the aspiring offender <laughs> so, okay yeah we are thinking of different ones and there's a guy who i i don't remember his name right now the the book i'm thinking of is called i don't know if it's five felonies a day or three felonies a day or ten fel it's something some number of felonies a day um, but also by a criminal defense lawyer, but prob I guess probably by a different guy. Um, unfortunately, I don't I don't recall the author's name right now. And no problem. I've been seeing uh, your mic light up. Do uh, you have something you wanted to toss in? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, most people who hold Bitcoin and I know, no, many people who hold Bitcoin that I know doesn't know about the Bcash thing, the fork, they didn't know that they can reclaim it. Now, however, almost every, most people who I know definitely don't know about Bitcoin gold. And I don't know about anything else like Bitcoin diamond or what? what Let's see, Super the, Bitcoin, know? United Bitcoin, Bitcoin Pizza, Bitcoin Private, uh... Shinobi, stop. Like, you're, you're giving everyone tax liabilities. Ruby, <laughs> oh, these things! Yeah, so I just wanted to toss in for Jennings' uh, argument that uh, you are actually breaking the law without knowing it. Well, the one caveat there is most of those obscure coins, like I said, don't have any value. Um, you know, under any reasonable willing buyer, willing seller standard. They're so thinly traded that any value would be so speculative um, that it would essentially be zero. The only one that you guys listed there that's, that probably had some value was Bitcoin Gold. Um, but the other one's probably zero, which at least minimizes the impact of this. I mean, I, I hate to be the dick that's creating tax liabilities, Janine, but um, I think a, a lot of them actually had some kind of sustance or substantial value um at least relatively to to zero like uh bitcoin diamond definitely had some some decent trading um united bitcoin at least during the launch period did 
Um, like there, there, there were a lot of, of these coins that had, you know, a couple millions or tens of millions in volume that, that were supporting, you know, low prices, but enough to really be an annoying headache. I wish, I wish the IRS would declare what level of volume, uh, they accept as a, you know, tradable asset or whatever that they actually care about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it would be nice if there was a, some sort of de minimis that they could issue on that point. I, regarding something like Bitcoin Diamond and that stuff, none of that stuff really exists in the U.S., though, uh, to my knowledge. And I don't know. I, I, what I'm saying right now is not really – I haven't really thought it all the way through. But I don't know that in determining fair market value, if it's appropriate – to include fair market value that would require a U.S. citizen to transact on an offshore exchange, which itself creates uh, a regulatory burden, right? Because now you have an FBAR issue, and most of those are unregulated and somewhat dangerous. Eh, I don't know. I don't. That seems a little. I don't know. I I, I don't have a great answer for that, but I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't know. It feels very not, I would feel pretty confident. Again, consult your own tax attorney. Um, on most of those ones, you mentioned that the value to a U.S. citizen is zero, um, that it didn't have any willing buyer, willing seller value. But I can't say that for sure. And you do raise a good point about how subjective a lot of this stuff is. Because, mm -hmm, I, mean, I mean, you know, some, some of those, like, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but I know some pretty big whales. Um, that cashed out those forks all the way down the line and like all the way to the tail end. Um, like they, they were getting relatively substantial sizes of money out of that um, from their, their stash. Yeah. And that's, that's a fair point. I mean, I, it could, this could really could just be an issue where I'm not as familiar with these forks and how, by the way, that's another, that's another good point. I mean, you have to have an accession of wealth that you're aware of. Um, and if you know, these, if you're not aware of it, that these things exist at the time that they had value, you know, if you didn't become aware of it until the, you know, the carousel stopped and the game's over, um, again, I don't think you have any value to claim there. Um, with something like Bcash, I don't know that there's any way you could have reasonably claimed that you weren't, I mean, it was a pretty big uh, story. I don't know if you were a Bitcoin holder that you weren't aware that Bcash was out there. And frankly, even if you didn't become aware of your accession of uh, accession to wealth until later, um, it, B, B cash still has value now. I mean, so at whatever point, you know, you quote unquote figured it out, if you're trying to make that argument, um, which again would be a tough argument, but even if that's an argument that you're making, it still had value whenever. Mm -hmm. It's just like the, the, this whole thing is just a fucking a clusterfuck is <laughs> real like and, and the ironic thing is like um i i i was pretty much in 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 the clear um almost entirely tax wise because i keep my income um low uh below the thresholds and th this just completely fucked me up <laughs> So, so it's it's like I, I I literally was like in c complete compliance with with tax laws, and now someone explained to a congressperson what a burn address is pronto. <laughs> yeah, but <sighs> golf clap for the the regulators of the, of the world. All right, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm I guess kind that was a no. Out. <laughs> yeah, I get that was that didn't work out. I, it, as soon as you said that, it just made me think of that segment uh, from George Carlin about golfers and get, replacing golf courses with homeless shelters. <laughs> In my defense, I'm going to point out for the listeners that after saying that, I realized that every single one of us would only have one hand available um, when holding their push to talk button. I just want to point that exactly. out. Exactly. That is true. The yeah, golf I mean, clap uh, you can't hear. You know, are there any other, uh, you know, sections in, in this mess uh, anybody wants to dive through? Uh, I, I think I've pretty much plumbed out my brain.
Uh, actually, well, I just thought of this. There was one positive note that I guess we can, uh, I should get in before we finish. And this wasn't in the revenue ruling, but it was in the, uh, it was in the FAQ. So it was uh, one thing that really was unclear up until now was whether or not you had to use first in, first out when selling Bitcoin or whether you could use specific identification as to which coin you're selling. Specific identification would also allow you to use methods like last in, first out, you know, things like that. Uh, and the IRS did clarify that you are allowed to use either first in, first out or specific identification, which is better than I thought because I was under the, if you had asked me to guess last week, I would have said that they were going to require first out. Uh, you know, I've always used personally first in, first out out of as an abundance of caution because I've always tried to be as conservative as possible, um, when filing my taxes. So, uh, that is one good note. If you've been using specific identification, which most of the major software like Bitcoin.tax has been supporting all along, uh, you're in the clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually uh, probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, that, that's actually what put me um, in, in the clear completely tax wise uh, minus the forks <laughs> because that, that um, turns everything I've ever done into long-term gains with a income low enough that I don't have to pay anything. Gotcha. So that, that, that is the, the one, uh, silver lining. I'm, I'm pretty happy about out of all this. I have, I mean, I don't know where it fits in, but the other question I would have is obviously there's a lot of people who are, Americans but living outside of the US, me included. So when they say fair market value, does does your actual residence matter? Like is it the fair market value in the country that you're resident in? Or is it fair market value in the United States because that's where the IRS is? You know, I've never read any well, I've never read any specific case law on that topic. Um so I, honestly, I can't answer that question. I don't know that it would necessarily be country specific so much as uh, specific to you, you know, what you could reasonably obtain between a, a willing buyer and willing seller. But I don't, that one, I really have not researched that issue. So I'm not really qualified to speak uh, all that intelligently on it. Because, I mean, for me, it'd be really interesting because I, I don't, I've never used an exchange and I don't plan to ever use an exchange. So if, if, if it's based on what I could reasonably obtain, that would have to be extremely localized and that's going to like really throw them off. Yeah, but, uh, they don't necessarily, but you could use an exchange, right? So, I mean, that's what sort of, uh... I did not do a ton of, I mean, I, a ton of fair market on this topic in advance of this show. So it's sort of like one of those things where it's like, you know, if I'm like, oh, you know, I don't leave my house, so I can't sell this gold bar. That typically doesn't fly. Um, exactly where the line gets drawn there, I don't know the, I'd have to do more, you know, legal research on that point. Yeah, well, I mean, so the reason I never, like, I mean, I haven't checked every single exchange, but as far as like the main one being Coinbase, the reason, one of the reasons I, I actually can't use it is because I don't have any form of identification that they accept. So I'm not actually open to, I'm not able to open an Um, so anything on Coinbase would be off limits. Like, I don't know if that's, cause could I reasonably go out and spend weeks learning to drive and then taking a driving test and all of that to get a driver's license, which they do accept. Sure. But that, I don't know if that would be reasonable. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I, that's a good question. I don't, that's not something I necessarily have the answer to. Uh, and I don't know what Coinbase specific, I've actually never had a Coinbase account. I have used exchanges, but, uh, I've never had a Coinbase account. So I don't know what they do and do not um, specifically accept as ID versus, you know, uh, versus other exchanges. I, I do know that there are other exchanges that accept passports. Um, cause I know I have clients that have done it, but regardless, this is a side issue. Uh, your, your point is very valid. So I, I don't know if you guys, but I have a summary. If we, we kind of finish this shoot. Okay. So.
I think we have to look at the reality and call this guidance stupid because we just identified seven blocking issues. It's impossible to find a price. It's hard to renounce the ownership, especially not retro retroactively. Most people aren't aware of the forks in the first place. Fungibility issues, huge fungibility issues with matching UTXOs because of the forks have to send the coins to shady altcoin exchange to get uh, USD from it. Technically hard to figure out how to move the fourth coins. And there are huge security issues with double spending because of the forks. So I, I don't think we can have any other conclusion on it, but it is stupid. Do we agree? Fuck yeah. And I mean, this is like the, the whole like point on the that that shy 256 i did yesterday like stop dealing with idiots who can't actually change anything like this is what happens <laughs> yeah i mean the only nuance i'd add to nopara's point i think really goes to what uh shinobi said there and basically it's bad for two well it's bad in that it was poorly written but even apart from that even if they had tried to do a better job there was still only so much they could do at the level of the Internal Revenue Service, since it's just an administrative agency. Really, the serious change needs to come by an act of Congress. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, you know, I, I, th I think that about uh, wraps up the topic. So, uh, you know, uh, any last thoughts out of anybody? And I think, uh, Jeff, you know, it might be a nice idea to tack the disclaimer on the end, too. Sure, I will do that. Uh, no last thoughts. I think I uh, rambled all them out at some point or another during this discussion. But uh, yeah, disclaimer here, uh, I'm an attorney and a CPA. I am not your attorney. I am not your CPA. Consult with your own tax advisor, file your taxes, and uh, nothing that I've said here should be construed as legal advice or tax advice, but solely an educational discussion. Do you need no para? Any final thoughts out of you guys? No, I just wanted to say that thank you for coming. Uh, it, it was really good to to see uh, the other sides too. And uh, don't take it uh, personally that we we were... I mean, we had pretty good arguments, so it, it, just don't take it personally. <laughs> oh, of course not. Yeah, no. And that... Like, you know, I'm not the IRS, <laughs> you know, I, that's why I kind of said at the beginning of the statement, you know, when I, when I discuss this stuff, I'm, I'm really just making descriptive statements. Uh, it's not that I think the statute is good, uh, or that, you know, I, when I, when I argue in, in, it's not even in favor, but like when I explain the IRS's position, it's not that I'm in favor of it. It's just that kind of is what it is you know and as a result you know you don't ever have to worry about me taking this stuff personally i certainly don't um and i always appreciate the opportunity to be on the show i i would like to say i mean i don't speak for everyone else here but i would like the irs to take this personally <laughs> mm -hmm. and i guess my final thought uh, before we wrap it up is fuck the irs see you next time guys bye bye Eeeh, <laughs> <laughs>